morning. Good to see all of you in here this morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Joe. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd love to meet you this morning if I've not ever met you, or if you're back for the very first time um, in a long time. I'll be right out in the commons after the service. Come by and introduce yourself or remind me of your name so I can uh, match those with your eyeballs and learn all over again, all right, who you are. So many today, this is your very first Sunday back, and I want to say thank you for being here. Welcome home. We're glad you're here. I want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for doing that every week. Many of you have been doing that for a year now, and we want to let you know that when you're ready, we're ready for you to be back. But for now, we're so glad that you've joined us today online. We really appreciate that. If you're watching on Facebook, please like and share so that others on your news feed can catch up with us either live or later on during the day. It's been said that there are three different kinds of people in the world. And if you're like me, at one time or another, you've been in each one of these groups. The three types of people are those that make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder, what what happened? (laughs) So maybe you're in that last group now. I don't know. In the same way it's been said, there are three kinds of churches in this world. There are those who cling to the past hoping that the glory days of yore will be back soon. And then there are churches who have a death grip on the present, trying to do everything they can to maintain the status quo. And then there are churches who are leaning into the future, learning to trust God more and take the risks that he asks them to take on his behalf so that they can fulfill the mission he has given his church. We're talking about the kind of church we've all wanted, and therefore we need to be. So we've been talking about the church we've always wanted to be. And today what we're going to be looking at is this idea, that if we're going to be the church that God dreams for us to be, if we're going to be the church we've always wanted to be, First Temple is going to have to rise to the occasion and learn to take risks. Big, big risks. And you know, we're all over the map on taking risks. Some of us would still wear seatbelts even if there was no law for us to wear them. Some of you will not even risk leaving your house without packing that concealed carry that you have with you right now. We've wondered what would happen at first. Probably if something began to happen here, it'd be the shootout at the OK Corral in no time, whatever. We, we all have different levels of risk. Some of us wear sunscreen. Some of us don't. Probably all of us have locks on our doors at home. And then I will tell you, wherever you are, I, these are not my people in terms of risk taking right here. These are not my people. I can look at that picture about 10 seconds before my palms start sweating. And I think he's having second thoughts. I I don't know why he's looking over the edge. They teach you don't do that. But he's probably just doing the math and realize, you know, I haven't been as nice to her as I should have been lately. I'm wondering if I actually fall asleep what's going to happen and how far I'm going to fall. Now, David Goddard claims that this is him and Carla back when they were in college and we stole this picture from their album. I don't know, Carla, but anyway, that's what he's saying. So when we're talking about taking risks as a church, what are we talking about? What's it look like? Does it look like that? That crazy adrenaline junkie couple? What does it look like? Well, this morning, we're going to look at part of the conversation we've been looking at all along in the book written by and spoken by the prophet Malachi. So if you're willing, take your copy of God's Word and look with me in the last chapter of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, or open up the church app. You'll find it right there, and you'll see all the scriptures that we're going to use this morning in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Now remember, this conversation that God's been having through his prophet Malachi with his people have basically been six series of conversations that sound like this. Hey, people, we need to talk. God's showing up and he said, we need to talk. You're, you are not keeping your end of the deal. I'm, I'm supposed to be your God and you're supposed to be my people, but, but you're not keeping the end of the deal. They are not the church, if you will, God dreamed for them to be. And so we're learning from those conversations what it is, not just how not to do it, but how to do 
how to be, how to become the church we all want to be and that God dreams for us to be. So let's pick up the conversation in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, and we'll read through 12. God speaking through Malachi, he says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you are not already utterly destroyed. For my mercy endures forever. That's a repeat of something he has said all the way through these conversations that started in chapter 1, verse 2, where he said, hey, folks, we need to talk, but I want you to know before I say anything else, I love you. I have loved you from the beginning. And so sprinkled throughout this conversation, God reminds us that he always says, I love you first. And in our best day, all we can ever say back to God is, I love you back, because he said, I love you first. Verse 7 Though you have scorned my laws from earliest time, yet you may still return to me, says the Lord of hosts. Come, and I will forgive you. And then the people kind of speak, and Malachi says on their behalf, but you say, we, 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 we haven't left you. We've never gone away from you. How have we done that? And then God speaks again. Will a human rob God? Surely not. And Yet you have robbed me. You've stolen from me. And the people rise up like, what? What do you mean? When did we ever rob you? And then God gives the answer that we've seen in all these conversations. He succinctly says the biggest problem, and once it's spoken, then they have to deal with it, and we have to deal with it. You have robbed me in the form of your tithes and offerings due to me. And so the awesome curse of God is cursing you, for your whole nation has been robbing me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be food enough in my temple. If you do, I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it all in. Your bank account won't be able to hold it. Your storage facilities will be overflowing. Try it. Let me prove it to you. Your crops will be large, for I will guard them from insects and plagues. Your grapes won't shrivel away from, before they ripen, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land sparkling with happiness. These are the promises of the Lord of hosts. So the conversation is going something like this. God shows up. And says, first, remember, I love you. That's why you're still alive. I've not annihilated you. I don't do that sort of thing. I'm your God. I love you. I care for you. And though you have drifted far away, you're welcome to come home anytime. My arms are wide open for you. And their response is, well, we don't really think we've even left. And isn't that the way it is sometimes? We, we get so distant, so comfortable in our independence from God, we, we even may not have realized how far we've drifted away. And so we go, what are you talking about? And God says, well, you can start by coming back by stopping robbing me. If you just stop that, that'd be a good first step. They're going, what? When, when have we robbed you? And he specifically says in verse 8, you've robbed me of your tithes and offerings due to me. And they're thinking, oh, like some of you are thinking, okay, yeah, preacher, we just got another stimulus check this week, and now you're talking on tithing. Okay, very good. Very good time. And I see what you did there, Pastor. I, I see what you did. Y'all planned that out nicely. Yeah, you know, when we planned this a couple months ago, we had no idea that uh, this would be the case this week. We just put this particular passage on this Sunday, this conversation, and you either believe me or not. So let's keep talking, okay? So anyway, um, let's talk about those tithes and offerings for a second. Now, you know that we've taught you that this mentioning of tithes and offerings, tithe just means one-tenth. So what was supposed to happen in that day is that everybody was to look at their assets, their wealth, how much they make, and give one-tenth of it to the Lord. And the idea was to give the first tenth, because when you give the first tenth, you're trusting that the rest is going to come in. And so that's what they did, to show that they trusted God and that he would provide for them and they would come through. And you, you know that we've taught you that, hey, this is the Old Testament and the law, and we don't live according to the law anymore, but many of us still use this 10% thing as a guideline. I mean, Valerie and I do, it's just kind of a guideline for us about just kind of a, a beginning point to say, okay, if we're really going to express our trust in God, where should we start? And that's where we've started. And so that's just a guideline for us, not a have to, but a guideline. And every time we talk about this topic, um, 
And I'm so grateful to be at First Temple. Many times when I've talked about this topic before, especially uh, churches I've pastored in the past, whenever I talked about this, uh, there was a curtain that kind of came down. It just, uh, people just didn't want to hear it, man. They just, I mean, it just came down. I've never felt that at First Temple. So you're going to have to work on your curtain thing if you don't want to talk about it, okay? But anyway, so anyway, every time we talk about it, there's always questions like, okay, how did God come up with the 10% thing? I mean, where did that come from? I mean, bless God, it wasn't 15%, right? But I mean, how did he come up with 10 why wouldn't it five or eight or nine percent or whatever? How did he come up with ten? I know it's a nice even round number, but how did he come up with that? And I, I thought through the years. I, I really have. I thought, okay, well, how did he come up with that? And one of the things I've thought about is I wonder if in the beginning of time, God just kind of did this calculation of all the work he was wanting to accomplish on the earth because God's work does take money, and he figured it all out and factored it all in and thought about it ahead of time and thought, okay, if I do 9%, not quite enough, 11%, that's ah, too much, I'll have some left over. Let's just do 10%. Hey, hey, I carry the one. Okay, Yeah, that works. I just imagine God doing something like that. Now, you may be thinking that's sacrilegious, but that's how my mind works. And so he came up with the 10%. I also think that maybe, and, and the idea is this, you know, I, 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 as a pastor, I've wondered what it would be like if we ever, as a body of believers across the globe, ever really did tithe 10%, how much work we could actually get done. In America, the average person gives 2.5% of their income to charity. And it's been that way for decades. It was higher in the Depression time, but once we got free of the Depression, it shrunk down to 2.5% and has stayed there for almost a whole century now. And so that's the way it is. Regardless of our standard of living, the giving has been at 2.5%. I wonder what it would be like if we did all do the 10% and just tried that. And, but, you know, I know I'm a pastor, so I'm biased. And so, yeah, all right. Well, uh, why did he pick 10%? I wonder if it's because it's enough to cause us to have to lean on him, to trust him, but not so much that it makes us have to suffer. And some of you are thinking, 10% would make me suffer. Oh, okay. All right. I get that. I understand. Um, I, I can see that. Uh, maybe it is that God really wants to allow us to participate in a significant level in his work. So that he, maybe all those reasons together, I don't know. But here's a bigger question. Why is it that he picked money to be the thing that our trust of him would be measured by? Why is it that he picked money? Why couldn't he just pick something else? But he picked money. I think Jesus gives us that answer. In Matthew chapter 6, in the New Testament, Jesus said it this way. He said, your treasure is going to be wherever your heart is. And you cannot serve two masters. You can't have a foot in both worlds. You can't serve God and your wealth. It's not possible to do that. What Jesus told us, the real thing here is, is that it's not about the money. It's about the heart behind the giving. You may be relieved to know that this passage, though it is often preached, and I mean with hammer and tong, about giving to the Lord's work, that's not what this text is actually really about. What it is about is our trust level of God with the stuff he's given us so that we give some back, trusting that he's always going to come through. What you and I have to do as God's people is we have to build our trust muscles. We have to grow in our willingness and our ability to trust God. These people were not doing that. They were thinking they got to kind of keep it all because what happens if this happens or this contingency or that happens and a famine comes or whatever. They were having trouble trusting that God would come through for them and always keep his promises. So you and I have to realize this. If we are going to be the kind of church we've always wanted to be, the kind of church that God dreams for us to be, we are going to have to learn to trust him. So that when he challenges us to take risks, we can do that. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. We, we talked about that in the beginning. What does that look like? Well, uh, there's a New Testament example of how this looks like. When, when Jesus sent the early disciples out, he sent them out in pairs. And he sent them on this very first kind of weekender excursion to do some ministry in his name. He didn't go with them. He sent them out in pairs. He stayed back. And when he sent them out in pairs, he gave them explicit instructions 
about how to carry out the ministry. And oh, by the way, also, don't take any money with you. Don't take a bag with you. Don't, don't, don't take extra clothes. Don't take extra shoes. Don't take any food with you. And don't even make lodging reservations in advance. Just go. Because he wanted to teach them absolute 100% total trust that he, through the Spirit of God, would provide for everything they needed. It's weird. The New Testament asks these guys, these disciples that he sent out for 100% trust. Not just 90% with the 10% giving, but 100%. Leave everything behind and trust that I will come through. And Jesus even said why it is that he did that. He did it because he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Meaning that your experience in ministry and living for me as my followers is not about money. It's not about logistics. It's about a spiritual engagement. And you're going to be no match for it if you're relying upon your own ability and self-sufficiency to get it done. You've got to rely completely on me. That's the same thing for us. We have to learn to trust. And so this morning, I want to give you a, an action step. We're, we're not almost at the end of the message where I usually put the action steps, but I want to give you one right now. And it's called a trust exercise. A trust exercise. You have an area in your life, if you're a follower of God, that probably he is talking to you about right now. It may or may not have anything to do with money, but there's an area that he's trying to get you to trust him more in than currently you are able to trust him. It may have to do with money. It may have to do with your job. It may have to do with uh, relationship. He may be asking something of you that's pretty bizarre or different. And here's the thing. All of us are going through this in different ways. And we're all in relationship with God. And in that relationship, he really hones in on those things he wants to work on you about and the things he wants to work on me about, the things he wants to work on Val about. And they may be all different things that he's asking of us. So I can't say... It's about money. I can't say it's about job. I can't say it's about relationship. I can't say it's about this or that. But you know what it is. I trust that God's really working in your life right now in an area. He's trying to get you to obey him in and trust him in so that you will grow in your understanding of how he's going to come through and provide. And here's the thing. If we're going to learn to do that as a church, how do we do that? Well, we just let the pastors and ministers take risks, right? We just let them do that. We just, we just trust them to grow in their trust. It's, it's, it's all of that. No, don't trust us and that stuff just by yourself. Come on. What we need to do is we need to all individually grow in our trust together. And if we're growing in our trust individually, we will then and only then grow in our trust collectively as a church and become the church God dreams for us to be. It's about us growing individually. So I want to challenge you with a trust exercise. And I want to encourage you in this way. Start small. Don't make it so painful. Start small. I, 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 during the ice storm, I didn't work out for four weeks. Now, the storm was only 10 days. But I, I took it to mean I didn't going to work out for four weeks. Anybody else? Okay, I didn't work out for four weeks. I knew better than that first time to come back to do it like I'd been doing it before. I had to start small and build back up again. Okay? So let's say it's about money, and the 10% thing's blowing your mind. Okay, start with 1%. You ever heard a preacher tell you that? I'm telling you that. Start with just 1% and build up. Now, if five years from now you're still at 1%, we're going to talk, okay? But, you know, just start small, all right? Now, all of us have been either in this situation or we've seen it like this right here, this little guy right here. You and I all know what happened right before he jumped. At one point in time, before he jumped, he motioned to dad, or if it had been mom, mom, closer, closer. I can't jump that far. I'm too scared to jump that far. Get closer, daddy. Get closer, mommy. Finally, he jumps. Excited, celebration, gets back out, jumps again, gets back out, jumps again. Eventually, what's going to happen? Move back. I'm, I'm, I'm good now. I'm, I, I, I trust you. You're going to come through for me. I'm not going to drown. Come, move back, move back, move back. Okay. So dad and mom takes a step back and he jumps farther and he jumps farther and he jumps farther three or four times and eventually gets out and comes around the pool. And what's he say next to mom or dad? Not move back. Move. Get out of the way. 
Get out of the way. I don't need you anymore. I wonder if sometimes you and I get so confident and so comfortable in areas that we think that we're good in, that we become independent and think that is spiritual maturity, where we become independent. From, okay, God, I don't need you now in that area. I'm good. I've got it figured out. Yeah, good, thank you, but good. No. Spiritual maturity, maturity is never about independence. It's about deeper and deeper and deeper dependence on God, leaning more. So maybe there's an area of your life that God's actually not talking to you about so much as it is that there's an area of your life you feel kind of confident and sure in, but when you look at it, you realize you're fairly independent in it, and God is wanting you to trust him even more in that area, and you need to build that trust. You need to work that trust muscle and get to growing, and so maybe it's like that. I want to encourage you in that way. Here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes we get so mature and independent from God that we self-secure things in such a way that we have backup plans and redundancies of redundancies and backup plans to our backup plans to the point where we're so secure in that that God doesn't even have a chance to show up and prove himself. And he even says here in the text, try this. In fact, this is, this is a little bit stretching for us the scriptures make it very clear that we are never to test or put god to the test but in this particular instance he actually says in some of the translations test me now in this try it let me prove it to you verse 10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be food enough in my temple. If you do, I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing so great you won't have room to take it in. Try it. Let me prove it to you. When is the last time that you allowed God to put you in such a situation dependent upon him to the point where if he didn't come through, both of you were going to look pretty stupid? When's the last time? That's what God is wanting from you. He's wanting that level of trust. He's wanting that from us as a church. And for us to get there as a church, we've got to get there individually. We've got to be growing in that. So I give you a second action step. On top of the trust exercise is a risk exercise. Give God a chance to actually show up. Take that trust exercise, identify that obedience factor that you've got involved that you're needing to grow in to trust him more, and then watch and see if God doesn't actually ask you to lean in even farther and risk something in that area. Very challenging. Because each of us have our own levels of risk tolerance based upon experience and really often about personality. Some are risk a verse and some are just adrenaline junkies you're the couple camping on the side of the cliff like in the picture in the goddards what's an area of trust god's speaking to you and what would that risk look like for you let me tell you what it looked like for me a few years ago i really sense god was calling me to be here as your pastor, this was four years ago now, um, this month, um, I was really praying with the committee about coming and being your pastor, and I really feel like there was a big risk, not in coming to be your pastor, but in something I knew God was wanting me to do when I became your pastor. And I knew that if it wasn't going to work, I wasn't going to come, because it was the kind of risk I knew God was telling me to take. And I wasn't sure how you were going to respond to it. And that is the risk of having a shared pulpit and shared leadership. To where I'm not the big dog. There's all kinds of risks involved with that. And I'll tell you, most of them are, are wrapped around the axle of my pride and ego. Because I was convicted that this church does not need to be built around a person or a personality. Or a particular person on a platform. But that need to be diluted and shared for the health of the body of Christ. But that's big risky stuff. I even have friends in the ministry that, dude, what are you doing? 
I had one guy pop off one time and tell me, man, I noticed that you're letting that younger guy preach now as often as you do. And I went, yeah, man, it's awesome. He goes, well, man, that's just risky. I went, okay, what risk do you see? Man, he's good. I went, I know I wouldn't be sharing it if he wouldn't. He goes, what if he takes that church from you and steals it from you? I wanted to hit him. Didn't, but I wanted to. Because here's the deal, knucklehead. It's not my church to lose and have it stolen from me to start with. It belongs to the Lord. And that's not just some spiritual Sunday school syrupy answer. That is the truth. But I had to take a big risk. Can I tell you something? In the shared leadership, I have never, ever, ever regretted doing that. God has been proving himself faithful in taking that level of trust. Now, there are other levels in my life I'm still kind of hanging on to and not really obedient in right now. And he's talking to me about that. Is he talking to you? I think he probably is. Let me talk to one particular group that might be in the room today and might even be watching by live stream today or catch this later uh, playing back the recording. If, if you're a person who's kind of checking this Jesus stuff out and you're really, you're really skeptical of it, especially now that you tuned in or showed up and the preacher, <laughs> he's talking about tithing. I told you, I told, I told you what would happen. If I tried this long enough, this, this is what the topic would be. You've got doubts. You're really skeptical that this Jesus is real and that God loves you and all of that. I, I want to challenge you to take a risk. I want to challenge you to practice a risk exercise, and that is something like this. In your own time, in your own way, in your own words, in your mind or out loud, I want to challenge you to take this risk. Have a conversation with God that you may even think is actually not there because you're not sure. And say, God, if you're real, if this Jesus stuff is right, I'm going to do what you said in the text today in verse 10. I'm going to try it. Prove it. Let me see it. Prove it. You said I could put you to the test, God. You're on. Go. If you'll do that, I believe that God will take the opportunity you've given him to show up. And I even tell you, I think I may know what it's going to look like. I want you to keep your eyes open for it. That's in the first service, I said, I want you to watch out for it. And automatically, that sounded like I meant, watch out. I don't mean that kind of watch out. I mean, look, watch out, okay? I want you to look for and listen for things that are expressions that God loves you. It's how he started this conversation. It's how he started all these conversations. Verse 6, I am the Lord. I do not change. That is why you are not already utterly destroyed. For my mercy endures forever. I love you first. Watch for, listen for expressions of God's love toward you. Because here's what I want you to know. I do not know what you think about God. But I do know what he thinks about you. And that is he loves you. Second thing I want you to watch for, because I think this is probably what it's going to look like, sound like, when God shows up and begins to prove himself. I think you're going to hear and see over and over and over again in conversations people are having around you that don't even know you, people that come across your path, or even friends can't shut up talking about it, or you're going to see all kinds of things about it in the next days and weeks and months, and it is about the cross of Christ and his dying for you. And raising from the grave. Because I will tell you. That it is the ultimate expression. And proof. That God is real. That he sent his son Jesus. To die for you. And me. And Jesus. Raised from the grave. To live forever and ever. That's where the proof is. And so you're going to hear. and see That stuff's just going to be coming at you. It's going to be coming at you. 
Will you pay attention to it? I pray you will. Because here's the thing. Jesus dying on the cross for us was a huge risk for God to take. Because he did it knowing that the vast majority of people would see it, observe it, and reject it. But he was willing to take that risk for anyone who would believe. If God is willing to take that kind of risk for us, what kind of risk would we be willing to take for him? Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Would you take the next 60 seconds to let the Spirit of God speak to you in the silence of the room about what he wants you to take away from this message? Listen for the voice of God.